So one of the most interesting technologies that we're working with today came from a 2003 DARPA program called Metabolic Dominance. And the mandate for that program was to make sure that U.S. warfighters were the most metabolically efficient on the battlefield. And the pathway that the DARPA program was looking at amongst a number of pathways, one of the most promising pathways was looking at ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate, as a more efficient metabolic fuel for our brain and bodies. Welcome to Fringe FM, the podcast that explores the edges of human understanding and looks at the technologies, trends, and societal norms shaping our collective future. Here, the world's top minds share their insights and predictions on the convergence, direction, and ethics of exponential technologies transforming life as we know it. You can learn more and stay up to date at fringe.fm. Billions of dollars have been made on optimization, software, and education. And yet it's interesting that the operating system of all of us, our bodies, our nutrition, is not something that typically sees the light of day, at least not from a, a tech side of things. Today we're changing that. Today we're going superhuman, so to speak, and looking into the aspects of mental and physical enhancement where we can all get an edge and be the best of ourselves. Today we've got Jeff Wu on the program. Jeff's the co-founder and CEO of Human, a research-driven company that provides nutrition to elite performers in the sport and military arenas. Human makes the world's first ketone ester drink based off of technology developed in DARPA's program to enhance soldier performance. The U.S. wanted their soldier to be the biggest, the baddest, the fastest, and the most efficient, and this is the result. Jeff started experimenting with intermittent fasting to activate metabolic pathways associated with longevity and cognitive function. For someone who wants to live longer and be smarter, this is incredibly prudent. And I imagine for many of our listeners, it's much the same. Jeff has a strong background when it comes to fasting, the quantified self movement, and looking into what it takes to optimize human performance. He's a serial entrepreneur with an exit in the past to Groupon, and an incredibly interesting person to have on the program. Today in our conversation, we cover how diet impacts mental and physical performance, the blood boy billionaires, and the methods of extending human life, why fasting and intermittent fasting are fast becoming a rage in Silicon Valley, the ways top performers are enhancing themselves without resorting to harmful drugs, why we may be headed towards different species of humans, the DARPA U.S. military science on superhuman performance, how health, happiness, sleep, and sex affect human performance and success, the reason the healthcare system is so screwed, why science takes so long to catch up to practice, and where we're headed in the quantified self-movement. Now, without further ado, I give you Jeff Wu. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. So, Jeff, who was your favorite superhero growing up? So, I've actually, I wrote an undergraduate freshman essay about this, actually. I, I, I like Batman. And that's because, unlike all the other superheroes, he's very much homo sapien, normal human being without magical superpowers. He's not Superman. He's not got, you know, magical rings. So, I thought it was very interesting that a human being, albeit with a lot of resources and financial resources, could train himself and, and compete with some of the, you know, ma- I guess the magical magical folks that, that, were, that were out there. Plus, Batman, Batman is the coolest. Let's, let's face it. Is that, what, is that what drove you into this business of human enhancement? I, I mean, I wouldn't say so directly. Uh, I think what really got me in, interested in the human performance space was, you know, I'm a computer scientist by training, so I studied CS at Stanford. And a couple of years into my career, I was building a software company, I had sold that company to Groupon in two, late 2013. And I just realized looking around that all my smartest friends at Stanford were figuring out how to make computers smarter, making algorithms smarter, basically helping us click more ads and all, and all of that. And those are all great careers and great career choices. But we're all humans. And I felt like we should apply more of our big brains to making humans better. So what really got me interested in human performance was this feeling of blue sky opportunity. We have all this technology, all this opportunity to really engineer different substrates or platforms of innovation. It felt relatively explored in the silicon uh, substrate, you know, playing with the hardware that exists today that are that, that make up all the computer. I mean, uh, you know, it was the podcast. This podcast is being run on that platform. It just seemed that the technolog- technology within bioengineering and the ubiquity of sensors that actually track biomarkers made it actually possible to innovate and build software, if you will, build technologies on top of the human platform. So it was really kind of a timing and 
interest perspective of why I got interested in human performance, but definitely read a lot of science fiction and played video games. I don't know if you remember this video game called Deus Ex. And it was about essentially implants and genetic engineering on on these humans in this dystopic future. So I, I think part of me always thought that this science fiction world would be very cool. I didn't think I would ever have the opportunity to work and, and contribute to the field. And it's really been a pleasure and, and, and kind of a fantasy come true to, to be operating in the space now. Yeah, it's incredible. You guys are helping to, to transform humanity, quite literally. There are, a, there are a lot of different ways that we're moving towards a species of enhancement. Can you break down why you got into what you did and what your thoughts are on some of the others, for instance, uh, drugs, uh, just enhancements via mechanical means, so cyborg, et cetera? Yeah. So I, I think progress and enhancement is, is inevitable. If you just look at human history, we've been really good at manipulating our environment and ourselves and developing technologies. And I think that making our innate selves better and more efficient is just really the next frontier. So I think the interest has been, I, I, you could say that the interest is relatively new in the sense that there's like the term biohacking, there's terms of genetic engineering and CRISPR. But I think the innate desire of why we want to do this is very fundamental of, of our species. We've always been improving ourselves and building technologies. Hey, Matt here. Jeff's about to break down the different camps of human performance enhancement. Now, I find this incredibly interesting that there are so many different ways to go about the same thing. We all want to live longer. We want to be smarter. We want to be more successful. We want to be stronger, faster. And it's interesting that there's so many scientists and startups like Jeff's coming at it from different perspectives and to see where those synergies lie. That was just a quick aside on my part. Now let's let Jeff get back. I would classify the broad streams of work around uh, perhaps a couple of different buckets. I would say they're all related in the sense that they're all applying engineering techniques to humans. But I would say that there's a segment of people focused on, I would say, genetic engineering. Can we manipulate our DNA to improve our performance, improve our longevity? There would be a group of people looking, you know, I would say more in in our in our work at at human uh, focused on nutritional interventions and tracking biomarkers and, and closing this closing this feedback loop in terms of improving longevity and human performance and then there's a, a work stream people called grinders who are you know you're sort of referencing the cyborgs uh, people implanting devices directly into themselves and seeing what kind of new uh, I'd say that's more of a performance art necessarily than perhaps actual enhancement or longevity improvements, but art will turn into actual functional improvements soon. Hey, Matt here. Speaking of functional improvements, if you haven't listened to our episode with Zoltan Istvan, the guy who ran for president is now running for governor, the libertarian transhumanist who's looking to live forever and talked about the technology to do it, then make sure you check that out. Go to Zoltan Istvan, search that on fringe.fm, and you'll find something interesting. Those would be the main three areas of function. But I think if you just actually look at high-performing people today. Military, folks in the military and high-performance athletes are basically tuning themselves like machines. So in some sense, the enhancement of humans is already happening and it's happening at the, at the, at the edge of our best athletes and our best soldiers. And we're going into the Wolverine type mode. Talk to me about how nutrition actually impacts performance, both mental and physical. Nutrition uh, is the most consistent input into our body. And I think I think it could be overly hand wavy or this is soft or this is kind of fluffy. But if you actually think about it, drugs in, in terms of pharmaceuticals or therapeutics are very potent, right? You can take a drug and you, you cure yourself of a viral infection, right? But if you think about the mechanism of how that works, you're taking just some exogenous chemical in, in the form of an antiviral or antibiotic, and it does something to your system. If you think about nutrition, that's essentially the same thing. You're providing your body consistently with some exogenous compounds. And there's, it, so I would look at it in a couple of ways. If you look at the eating patterns of the day and the demographics and the trends of, the trends of how our society is looking, you know, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome is up and to the right. Neurological conditions up and to the right. And a lot of that data of showing why that is happening suggests that our nutrition of a lot of processed foods and a lot of high carbohydrate and high sugar and high fat load is contributing to that. So if you, perhaps one way to put it simply, um, if, if you're racing a Ferrari car and you're putting in really crappy crude oil, that engine is going to 
mess up and blow up and it's going to take a lot of maintenance and, and fixing to put that back in a top tip top condition. I think folks that are in, interested in cars or interested in aircraft, you just know that the fuel fueling is so important. You just, you can't make something run super well with really bad inputs. And the same thing with the human body. And arguably the human body is a lot more complicated than an aircraft engine or a car engine. So in a lot of ways, the, the, the fuel that affects our mental and physical performance really dictates it. Talk to me on the mental side, because it's very easy to visualize physical. And while I have a pretty solid comprehension of the mental side, a lot of people haven't. So we'll briefly talk about how we can more generally speaking, get a clearer, straighter head. And then after that, a little bit on nootropics and what your company's doing. Sure, sure. So I, I think one way to think about it is, I think we've all had an experience of eating a very heavy, sugary lunch, and you get that afternoon slump. And physiologically, what's happening oftentimes is that you get this huge glucose spike, a glucose spike, uh, a blood sugar spike, and it requires an equally big spike of insulin to shuttle all that glucose into your muscle, into your fat cells. So then sugar starts crashing really quickly. So you get this very undulating curve of high sugar, low sugar, high sugar, low sugar. And if you do this over time, you get this, you get sort of addicted to this glucose insulin, I, I guess, pattern. And, and oftentimes people counteract that with stimulants like caffeine, like a cup of coffee in the afternoon to, to basically buoy up their carby, maybe poor nutritional choices. So a lot of people in our community at Human, you know, a lot of people are, and I think in Silicon Valley and just in the world general are looking at intermittent fasting or eating low carb ketogenic diets to fend off some of the downsides of being caught in this glucose insulin roller coaster. So that's like a very, I, I would say, tangible way to think about, you know, something that I think a lot of us can relate to. Just a quick terminology for those unfamiliar. Intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating is the process of optimizing the times of day you're eating and eating at significantly shorter intervals. So typically, this is a 16 and 8 protocol where 16 hours of the day you're not eating, 8 hours you are eating. There have been studies and nutritional benefits associated with doing something similar, and I know I have seen results. Now back to Jeff. But just broadly speaking, your, your brain, your neurons require energy to function, and if you're not fueling them with the right precursors to build more neurons or, 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 or build more neurotransmitters or allow them to actually generate ATP and actually do their, 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 their own processes, they don't function as well. So in some sense, again, you know, you need to fuel your engines with the right fuel. And this is the, this is the first step. Once people have nutrition in place, they have fitness in place. That's when the performance enhancers, so to speak, come on board. So things like nootropics and what your company is working on. Yeah, I, I think that's an important frame to think about it. I would say that make sure your nutrition is right. Make sure you're doing some basic exercise, making sure you sleep right, right? If you're not, those are the lowest hanging fruit. I think a lot of where biohackers go wrong. And I think there's legitimate criticism there is that people just don't eat, don't exercise, don't sleep and don't treat themselves, don't eat a healthy diet. And then they just want nootropics to make them smart. And it's like, no, you, you don't, forget about the nootropics, like make sure you just actually put your life in order first. So nootropics, kind of a buzzword in the last few years. And that's something that our company at Humans were brought onto the stage. And I, I would perhaps claim some credit in helping that become more of a term used in common parlance, although still relatively niche. But nootropics is really an umbrella term for compounds that enhance different attributes of cognition, like uh, memory, learning, resilience to stress, in enhancing those abilities in a non-toxic way. So realistically, if you look at the stats right now, it's something like 20 to 25% of college students take Ritalin or Adderall at some point. Why, yeah. is, why is that becoming so common? Is it just the competition in the marketplace? Is it people are oversaturated from shitty food so that they're not able to focus? What, what's the deal? I think it's a combination of both. So I think from a competition perspective, you're already seeing the, there just seems to be a, an acceleration towards a Pareto style out, uh, law style outcome. So the 80-20 outcome, meaning that if you are you know, top one or two a field, you get 80% of the, of the economic reward. And everyone else gets to share the, the bottom 20% of the reward. So because we're in a more globalized, connected economy, the competition set for all of us is basically the entire world. Whereas 200 years ago, we were just basically competing with people in our village. Now we're competing with 7 billion people that are more and more 
uh, connected and, and, and learning quicker and quicker. So I think there's an edge towards competition. There's more to gain. Uh, and, and, and that seems to be accelerating. So that, that's one aspect. Um, so it, it stands to reason that, yeah, people want to invest into brains to, to make sure that they have some, some sort of a competitive edge there. And that's, again, that's happened in sports. That's happened in professional athletics. And I, I, I would like to think that, you know, software engineers or investment bankers or consultants and investors are basically professional mental athletes, right? Like your scoreboard is the amount of value, economic value you can create. And it's pretty, I don't know if I want to say zero sum, but it's pretty competitive. That's why we saw Leonardo DiCaprio in The Wolf of Wall Street hitting lines of coke and doing whatever possible to get advantages. In Wall Street, it's a it's a dog eat dog or wolf eat wolf game, and you got to be the best. So that's what he was doing, and you could see very similar attributes or very similar patterns in different industries. It's not healthy, and Jeff's team is trying to fight back on this, but it is something that we all have to recognize. Yeah, I think the the the, the you can I mean this might be a little bit of a segue, but you can make the argument that if you're creating really good value for the world, it's not zero sum. You're just adding value to the to, to humanity. You're not necessarily the, capturing it though, like the guy who invented penicillin. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think he was very altruistic, right? He, in that story, he gave up IP rights around it. He just basically open sourced penicillin, which is very noble of him to do. I mean, he saved millions of lives. And so I think there's one side. So there's bigger and bigger outcomes because of this global connected market. And there's a more and more of a winner take all dynamic. That's why you see like Facebook, you, you're, you know, a $500 billion company in your MySpace, you're like, you don't exist anymore. And I think there's an argument that the world is going to look more and more like that. The second part is that the tools for nootropics just aren't that great yet, right? And I think, so Ritalin, Adderall, uh, Vyvanse, all these ADHD therapeutics, they're essentially amphetamines. I mean, they are amphetamines. They're proprietary and amphetamines, which is the formal name for speed, that is you know, scheduled for pharmaceutical use. So these are pretty potent stimulants, central nervous system stimulants, but they have downside effects. It's quite well understood that you build up a tolerance of these things. And oftentimes, anecdotally, people just end up being addicted. I wouldn't say addicted, but at least dependent on the use of... Like and coffee. Yeah. So I, I think, co- yeah. So I think caffeine is a very uh, relatable one, right? Like, it's something that I've been cycling on and off and I've been cycling because it's just like, do you actually want to be dependent on exogenous compounds? So there's, there's an open question there. I'm proud to say I managed to cut out quite a bit of the caffeine intake that I had in my diet. I was probably doing four to five cups a day, maybe a month or so ago, and have managed to reduce that down to one to two cups. It's incredible what you can do when you decide. And just the, the sluggishness that I felt when I was drinking a lot of coffee it was very clearly negatively impacting my performance by being dependent on caffeine. It's interesting, especially looking at what you put into your body as not only food, but fuel. But yeah, so I think part of our interest in nootropics and developing nootropics and doing more research in the space is, can you have cognitive enhancers that aren't addictive and aren't dependency uh, building that actually aren't, it can, it can help you over the long term? Where I think a lot of these stimulants are short-term acute boosts, but have you know, long-term costs to pay. Talk to me a little bit more about the science of human enhancement and also of longevity or life extension. Yeah. So human enhancement, the history has just been interesting in the sense that I, I was just try, sort of tracing back the history and a lot of where enhancement came from, came from the military or came from enhancing the soldier class to dominate other, uh, you know, other tribes, essentially. You had this with, uh, you know, Incan or Aztec warrior tribes chewing coca leaves before going into battle. And like a very, a lot of different cultures have these sort of traditions that improve stamina, improve endurance. So one of the most interesting technologies that we're working with today came from a 2003 DARPA program called Metabolic Dominance. And the mandate for that program was to make sure that U.S. warfighters were the most metabolically efficient on the battlefield. And the pathway that this DARPA program was looking at amongst a number of pathways, one of the most promising pathways was looking at ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate as a more efficient uh, metabolic fuel for our brain and bodies. Another definition, ketones. Ketones is what your body uses for energy when it's depleted of carbohydrates. There's two different sources of energy, carbohydrates and fats. Protein is broken down into carbohydrates for fuel. Traditionally, we're in what's called glycosis, meaning we're using carbohydrate or carb-based energy. But if you get into the situation of either long fasts or eating a largely fat and protein-based diet with very little carbs, you can get into what's called ketosis. 
This is looked at in different ways by different people. Some purport this to be a nirvana. Some purport this to be incredibly detrimental to your health. Jeff's on the on the positive side of this, but I've seen a lot of a lot of positive studies and benefits from this. But it's always hard to tell when people are talking about their nutrition and health. So there's so 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 there's been a lot. So I would say you know looking at enhancement has been throughout history, and it's been especially interesting from a military context. And it's something that we're actually commercializing as a company today. So after a number of clinical trials, both on humans and animals, the specific ketone compound called a ketone ester that we're bringing to the market and commercializing enhances aerobic performance. So on elite British cyclists, we're able to improve time trial performance 400 meters further in a 30-minute time trial, for example. Uh, Mice on this ketone ester were solving mazes 38% faster than control, and they're running 32% longer than control. So... And, and, and you might ask the natural questions like, how does this even work? Is this some crazy compound? Well, if you actually look at the metabolism of what, how ketones are metabolized, ketones are just more efficient than carbohydrate or glucose per unit oxygen. So if you can actually improve the energetics of the mitochondria, which is the power plant of the, of, of the cell, it's how our cells produce ATP and, 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 and which is what fuels all of, our, all of life essentially you can sort of extrapolate how that can have interesting downstream effects. So that speaks towards human performance. Um, again, a lot of active research with the military and with athletics. That's, uh, I would say that within the last five to 10 years, sports science, this field of looking at tracking all the biomarkers like heart rate variability, blood glucose, blood ketones, inflammation markers like uh, HSCRP. These are all things that might have been done in, as, as medicine, as, as, as a therapeutic. Uh, purposes or in a research lab and now is being done on a daily or, or weekly consistent basis to improve performance. Um, and then longevity has been an especially interesting topic. Again, people have wanted to live forever since always, right? You know, Chinese emperors drinking mercury to, to, <laughs> that obviously backfired. Or, or you had, you know, the city of gold and, or the fountain of youth in Spanish and European tradition. And then and, and there's been recent, I would say, perhaps tabloidy gossip news with people like Peter Thiel, in, you know, using young blood to this technique called parabiosis. What's the, yeah. What's the science on that? Because it, the science actually seemed to be pretty good. The science is, I, I would say is, well, I guess what is your standard of pretty good? I would say it's promising in the sense that when they transferred young rat blood to an older rat where they, they like binded them together, it was good for the older rat. And so, so there's definitely some signal there. Like, I, no doubt. Um, there hasn't been any human studies that I've seen. I don't know if the, that would be interesting to see if that would pass ethical review. The mechanisms aren't clear. So I, th- I know there's different groups looking at what is in young blood that doesn't exist in old blood, for example, as like one way to sort of tease out the mechanism. But stem, stem yeah, that, that seems reasonable. And yeah, it could be, you know, stem cells, but then you have to say, okay, you know, there'd be, so again, stem cells, would that, would, would you have to make sure that there's no rejection from someone else's stem cells, right? If you could have your own stem cells purified, would that mimic the effects of parabiosis, for example, right? So it's like, so I think there's open science. What is happening that is seeming to, to, to work in, in the transfusion of young blood in rats into to older mice? But yeah, I would say that, you know, if you are a billionaire and want to be a little bit speculative, I don't think it's unreasonable. I think it's, it, it could be something there. But I would say that a lot of the interest has also been looking at caloric restriction or intermittent fasting. There's been a lot of research there. If you actually look at what has extended lifespan in C. elegans, in rats, and starting to go into dogs and primates, caloric restriction, which is this notion of restricting the amount of calories one intakes, is consistently increasing lifespan. So that seems to be conserved across a number of species. Unfortunately, you can't really do a human, a controlled human study, or you, you could, but it would take a long time, right? You have to track caloric restriction over 80 plus years. But they've done some monkeys. Uh, there's been two monkeys uh, studies, one at the NIH and one, I believe, in Wisconsin. I've been looking at that, and there's been pretty interesting results there. Uh, but, but I guess let's zoom out a little bit. I think caloric restriction, ketogenic diets, intermittent fasting all seem to be related, and that seems to be a very interesting avenue of looking at longevity research. And that's something that we're interested in, in as well. And that's also related to our ketone ester technology. Because if you actually look at caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, ketogenic diets, one of the endpoints of all those three different interventions is that it raises blood ketone levels. Well, 
That's exactly what the ketone ester does. We can raise your blood ketone levels the equivalent to 10 days worth of fasting in 30 minutes, which is pretty potent. So we're excited to look into the research and see can some of the longevity effects of caloric restriction be mimicked by having ketone esters. Let's play devil's advocate though. From my point of view, how I would see that is less metabolic stress equals less aging. So, but because they're eating less or because they're eating at less time frames, or because they're eating less carbohydrates, they have generate less stress. So ultimately live longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's something to that. Uh, so there's, I would say it's like, it's a very nuanced space. So I think that seems to be one of the main mechanisms of why caloric restriction works. But if you actually look into the little bit of, of mechanism of why it works, so Slowly metabolism is one, was one endpoint of what, what, what's going on with caloric restriction. If you actually look at ketone metabolism versus carbohydrate metabolism, for example, ketone metabolism reduces reactive oxygen species production, and it actually is a scavenger of reactive oxygen species. So is the slowing of metabolism through caloric restriction the dominant effect, or is it because you're burning ketones, and ketones are reducing ROS, speci- ROS creation and scavenging ROS? Are some of the downstream pathways of longevity pathways like FOXO3, is that, is that from slowing metabolism, which it doesn't seem to be related to, or is that from signaling from beta-hydroxybutyrate, uh, BHB? So again, I think these are all interrelated. I think longevity is very, very complicated. I, I, I think these all interplay together. But I think that's where the research is exciting to have something like a ketone ester, where it's like, okay, you can actually tease apart now in, in research to test the ketones themselves separately from caloric restriction or a ketogenic diet. So hopefully like some of these questions will be answered definitively. And that's how it works for the science. It always takes yeah. time. So I want to, I want to transition a little bit into the quantified self and IOT movements, how those yeah. are, how those are impacting human health and performance, and then what average listeners can do if they want to start taking, taking their health into their own hands, so to speak. Yeah. I think measure you, if you can't, you can't, you can't optimize what you can't measure, right? That's a very engineer's approach to thinking about health. Or, or any problem. And it's interesting that no one, I mean, it's, and, and how do we apply that to health or our own performance? And I think that's what, quanti- that, that's what the quantified self movement and that's what the biohacking movement as I see it is all about. Can we apply that same care and attention that we treat our phones and our cars and our homes? We have all these sensors on all these things. We like basically know more about our, you know, the, the engine status than we know about our own bodies. So that's something I've been experimenting with a lot. So for most of last year, I was wearing a continuous glucose monitor. Uh, so I can just track my blood sugar continuously just through, uh, through Bluetooth. And that was very enlightening to just understand how my body is responding to different inputs and how it's responding to exercise and start correlating that to different stressful events and maybe seeing, hey, can I preempt or have a prophylactic towards something that I know would be stressful by managing my blood glucose and understanding that beforehand. So I think in the future, we'll have a real-time dashboard of all uh, all relevant biomarkers. I think that will come sooner than later. I think it's pretty silly that today most people get their biomarkers checked and these could, you know, these are like, you know, inflammation markers, insulin markers, your lipid panel. These are things that you would you ostensibly go to your doctor once a year to get your blood drawn. But most people don't even do that, right? Like I don't know, when's the last time you had your blood drawn? I, I was more recent just because I wanted to do some tests and do, yeah. uh, I'm yeah. more into this movement, but yeah, your average exactly. person doesn't exactly. care. Exactly. I mean, I'm a, it's a, I've been doing this basically every month, every quarter recently, just like get a real, a real understanding of how my biomarkers evolved towards different experiments, right? So I've been experimenting with ketogenic diets and, and all of that. So but, most probably, people, but most people like, just don't know what any of their markers are until they're sick and it's too late. And I think a big part of the value of quantified self is just understand your baseline in a quantified way and have this corpus of data that you, and really just, you, you have to be the, your own best advocate for your own health. And I think that a lot of people today in our culture somehow just push out responsibility to the doctor or they're just like not very thoughtful about their health until, it's, until you're actually sick. And if you talk to, you know, I've talked to so many doctors and, you know, there's, you could say there's a lot of, challenges in the healthcare system. I think there's a lot of doctors that really want to help people, but like, but I think any reasonable doctor would say there's like just weird incentive structures that are just messed up with the healthcare system today. And I would like to see a world where doctors are more like guides or coaches that help you get to your goals and don't 
And, and, and these doctors aren't these ivory towers that you can't you know, have a real conversation with. These people should be you know, really your guides to, to, your, to your health. Because then oftentimes, you know your body, you care about your body and your health, you're the machine of your body more than anyone else in the world. And you should feel that responsibility to understand it. And I think that this culture of like basically abandoning responsibilities is quite harmful. So this, this transitions nicely into something I wanted to bring up. It seems as if we're moving towards an era where people that are informed and proactive are becoming more productive, more successful economically, physically, et cetera, via both methods like this and methods which we will start to get into with yeah. genetic engineering and potentially mechanical or IoT implants, et cetera. Are we yeah. moving towards an era where we have different species of human? Yeah, I mean, I think that's going to be a uh, very touchy subject. But I, 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 if I had to answer bluntly, I, I think we're in, headed in that direction, absolutely. And I don't know if that's good for society or for civilizational stability. Like, uh, like I, 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 I'd say I think it's going that way, and I'm not sure it's a good thing. And you, you, start, you, you already see this in terms – I think you, there's, been a, there's a popular Atlantic piece looking at the self-selection of mating and, and marriage and, and building families with people in different economic groups, right? So you have, like, people that are college-educated or having, you know, high-salary jobs are marrying other people that have high educations and high-salary jobs. So this intermingling of different academic backgrounds coming together and, and marrying is becoming rarer and rarer. So we already see a segmentation or self-segmentation with economic classes. And again, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, right? Like that's just in, independent care people making their own life choices. And I think you should let people marry whoever they want. But there does there seem to be that self-selection. And it just seems that these things will accelerate. Like the, uh, so I, I think it's incumbent on, the in, uh, on, on companies like ourselves or the community or regulators to make sure that these tools are accessible to everyone. Right. Like, I think this really goes bad if, you know, parabiosis or longevity things are only rich people can afford them and only rich people can ever afford them. Then I think that will accelerate the bifurcation of human society and human speciation. I think you've had sort of these horror stories told before with technology, right? Like, the, the, I think there was this trope maybe 20 years ago that the computers and smartphones would would divide people because people with computers would hang up people with computers and people without computers would be up in the stone ages. And that has not turned out to be the case, right? Like there's $20 Android phones that are letting people in sub-Saharan Africa skip like seven levels of technology, right? They're going from not even having landlines to having wireless high fidelity, you know, connections. So can that, can that same trend happen with human performance technologies? I hope so. I'm really doubtful. I mean, I'm curious what you think. Do you think that like we're just going to be on this path of just, just speciation? I think, we're, I think we're definitely on a path of speciation because technology starts out incredibly expensive, so only the rich can afford it. Bill yeah. Gates was one of the early guys to be able to use a mainframe computer, and it turns out he, he started Microsoft. But if you look at these type of technologies, they're even more radical because evolution's in every thousand year, every hundred thousand year type time horizon. If it suddenly becomes something you can do in your lifetime or something that's generational, then there doesn't seem any reason to suspect that you can catch up once you're behind on a flywheel. It's like trying to start an e-commerce. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's good. I think that's a good argument. I mean, I think, I mean, the, the, the altruistic, I don't know if that's altruism, but like, I guess the, the, all of humanity is a family side of me. It's like, how do we enable people to, we have to try not get left behind. Right. I, I think, I think it, it's incumbent to the stability of civilization to make sure that we give everyone the, the equal opportunity to, have a chance to make it right. Like I don't. I don't think so. I think it's beyond our pay grade as just you know individual contributors. I think this will be a government, you know, industry, societal pact when all these technologies really start landing. Uh, how we can disseminate these technologies? I think. But I think you're right. Uh, like so. Yeah. I mean, I think with the iPhone. So it's interesting, right? Like I think with with mobile phones, we've seen that the technology has been able to democratize relatively quickly. Uh, with electric cars, I think it's still, the history is still to be written, but it seems that like there are fairly affordable electric cars now, right? That's being democratized relatively quickly. Is there something uniquely different with biological improvements? It's maybe. Ability, it's ability versus maybe. access. Yeah, maybe. And, and maybe they just, you know, if, if you don't have these enhancements, you just die out and it just ends up, and, and like, it's just such a short snap 
in that in, in a time horizon where it doesn't need it just gets solved in a generation. But that that's that I mean that just sets up like a really scary you know dystopic future where like I don't know some percentage of the world is just going to be left behind and the other world other half of the world is going to go into this enlightened utopic for you know this is like the Elysium movie this is like mm-hmm. all these sci-fi movies that have explored these 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 ideas. Basically, the question would be, if you start genetically enhancing people, are you able to make larger jumps than the previous ones have made? So if you have lots of little steps that the super elites are using to enhance and enhance, enhance one, two, 10%, later on, once that gets to even more efficient, can you do a 10% enhancement for the same amount as a 1% right. enhancement? Right. You just hit escape velocity and, and it's like the singularity. You just, you just, you just skyrocket away, right? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see. It's very interesting. I want to transition a little bit now. So part of the purpose of this podcast is to get some of the smartest and most innovative people on to talk about their industries. And part of it's to explore the ones they're not in, but are interested in. So what are you interested in? What other industries outside of your own do you find most fascinating? Hmm. I mean, I guess if you define our industry as fairly narrowly, I'm in, you know, we are a nutrition company that works with elite athletes and elite uh, operators and folks in the military. And I think if you scope out a little bit, I'm interested in implants, like basically the cybernetic future, right? Like these brain computer interfaces. Can we have these implants that make ourselves uh, or enable ourselves to have these real time data streams about our, our physiology and biology? So, but that, that might be just overall, you might say that, hey, you're just interested in human performance. So I'm interested in human performance and, and that is true. But if you want to go outside of human performance broadly, what am I interested in? Hmm. I, I had a recently uh, interesting discussion with, uh, uh, the new CTO of Coinbase about can you start your own country um, and how would you build, you know, with the emergence of cryptographically secure ways to store value, store ownership, could you create a society from scratch uh, with engineering principles or just like modern modern understanding of how to optimize society, how to optimize geographic locations, right? I think that's kind of interesting, right? If you actually think about how our cities are built, they're really legacies of, of, of like the initial tribes of humans needing to be near water sources. And then you kind of just build a village around this river bank, and then you build castles, and then you build horse carriage pathways, and now you build like roads for cars, and now you have some underground subway systems. Um, but what if you just built a city from scratch uh, with scooters, no cars, everything optimized for walkability and light, light transit options? What if you structured you know, how people lived in a way that made more geographic sense? And what I mean by that is that for me, you know, for, for a lot of us, we spend most of our time at work or at the gym or, or, or something, but those are pretty randomly distributed. What if you had a system where right outside your house, you had your, the cash around you was like all the things that you did on a daily basis. And then a little bit further off from you were the things that you did on a weekly basis. And then even further off from you are things that you did on a monthly basis. So you can think of this in a computer uh, systems version of your CPU, an L2 cache, uh, you know, your RAM, your hard drive, your interconnected you know, drive on a different computer, on a, on a different network. Could you have that same analogy towards human geographic locations? That's an interesting area that I think would be fun to think about and work on, right? Like, can we just redesign our cities, redesign how we live? And that will be especially huge as we start to explore space. I think, I think a system like that could become problematic because then we have the fat-ass American problem where no one goes anywhere and we all get a little bit overweight. <laughs> but Europe seems to have a better system in terms of having to move from a health perspective. But again, if people were actually good about fitness, that would be another story. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing that I... Is, is super passionate for, for me personally. I mean, I think I never was like a super athlete or, you know, I wouldn't, there's nothing to write at home about me being athletic, but I think spending a lot of time with military folks, spending a lot of time with elite athletes, you know, a couple of my colleagues in the office, you know, are competitive triathletes. So, you know, Brianna Stubbs, our research lead, just qualified for the world championships for the 70.3 Ironman off of her first Ironman. And she was like a two-time world champion row before that. And I don't mean to brag for them. It's just like these people, like, like they, they like run 20 miles before coming to work. And I was like, what the hell? Like, why are you doing, like, how do you do that? And like, are you, and, and then I think you spend so much time with these people and you realize that they're not, 
you know, obviously there's a difference in amount of time spent, maybe some difference of just talent of being a better athlete just from, from your genetics. But they're also just human beings. And why was there such a big gap? And it's just like, can you just be thoughtful about actually exercising and being, putting yourself in, in building yourself up to be fit? And, you, and, and it, you just realize that so much of the limitations of all of our physical abilities, I think it's just so societally constrained. You know, our ancestors were just carrying our entire lives on their back for like 30 miles a day. And like, that was just like what they did. And I think now it's like people are scared to walk for half a mile. And just like, why is there that such a big gap? Like our genetics have not changed that much in the last 10,000 years. So I just want to encourage people to just like not, just to be a little bit more thoughtful and get out there and be active. It's like the people that are out there, you watch on TV that are dunking on people and running 26 miles. Yeah, of course, they put in a lot more hard work than all of us, but like they're not, they're not like unreachable. Unless the genetic engineering gets more interesting. <laughs> In which case, the NFL will be quite something. Where, yeah. um, where are the best places for people to learn a little bit more about not just you guys, but the industry in general. What's happening? They want to enhance themselves. They want to learn about quantified self. They want to learn about intermittent fasting or other sources. Yeah. So I would say that there's quite a bit of a community that we've helped foster at Human. So we have a lot of guides at human.com slash library where we have guides around intermittent fasting, guides around ketogenic diets, uh, pretty big discussion groups actually on Facebook called WeFast. So that's one of the largest online intermittent fasting groups. And, and that's just, uh, you know, we have, I, get, I think like 15,000 people there now just like talking about their fasting routines and different biomarkers are tracking and encouraging each other to, to track and, and improve themselves. But beyond, you know, platforms or services that we have, I would say that like there's a lot of great communities on Reddit. If you look at, you know, Reddit are nootropics or longevity.org, which is a longevity forum. Uh, those are pretty good resources as well as just people talking ideas, sharing ideas. One area that I really like, but this might be deeper than some of the, the, the casuals out there that might be listening. Just look at PubMed, like just read white papers that are being published around longevity, around ketogenic diets, around ketone esters, around ketosis. And again, I think, I think it's like, I don't have a formal biology or, or medical training, but you can learn. Like if you actually just talk to people in medical school, they're just reading books and, and learning and they spend a lot of hours learning. And why can't you just learn this, this, this is the same stuff, like the books and the biology is out there. So I think part of it, just get out there and read and talk to people. And let's be totally honest, you probably know a lot more than they do because this stuff is not covered enough in traditional <laughs> medical curriculum. We, it's pretty much, how do we fix acute problems? How do we run a terribly inefficient healthcare system? Well, I would say just in, in very, very narrow spaces of you know, areas like exogenous ketones or keto metabolism, I, I would feel confident saying yes. But, but of course, like doctors, I think you know, they're very broadly trained. And in some ways, it's, it's, it's interesting if you actually like boiled down into what they study and what they learn. And in a lot of ways, they're technicians on humans. I think that the, the most thoughtful doctors really, really grok the theory and the mechanisms. But I think a lot of doctors can sort of get away with just like the algorithm of their wheelhouse of like, okay, these symptoms means these potential uh, etiologies. And therefore, like, I need to do these tests and like I prescribe these drugs, right? And like, that's like basically the workflow of a doctor and try to do that in 15 minutes. And then get their insurance codes, re, you know, build and, and paid for. AI may be coming for them. Yeah. That will be, uh, that will be very powerful. <laughs> uh, one thing we like to do towards the end is to have a, a challenge, something to leave listeners with. It can be something to check out, something to try, yeah. uh, a business to start. What would you like to challenge listeners with? Uh, one thing I think people should experiment with if you are interested in longevity and fasting, try a 36-hour fast. That means don't eat any food for 36 hours, drink a lot of water. Oftentimes I do a 36 hour fast on Tuesday. So I have my last meal on Monday night dinner, you know, stop eating at 7 PM. Don't eat all of Tuesday and have breakfast at 7 AM on Wednesday. And that's a good primer to get, jumpstart your body into ketosis, to generate ketones, get off of carbs. And uh, it's a good metabolic challenge. And I think when I first started fasting, I thought that would have been insane. You know, like, Oh, you can, you, you cannot eat for that long, am I going to die? And you just realize that most, our bodies are quite resilient and most of us have an overabundance of energy. I mean, if you look at the chronic diseases facing us today, they're all diseases of chronic overconsumption, not underconsumption. 
luckily, you know, in, in the first world, there's no famine, right? The, the, the disease is overeating. So I think that's an interesting challenge. Check it out. Completely agree. That would be very valuable. And if that seems like too much, I would recommend guys just looking into intermittent fasting, a 16 and eight, uh, the 16 and eight protocol, basically. Yeah, 16 and eight. Yeah, that's great too. Yeah, that's, that seems to work pretty well for me. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what, what I basically do on a daily basis, 16, eight. Uh, so 16 hours fasted, eight hour eating window. And that's like very, very doable. Think about it. You have eight hours to eat. So like, it's, it's like you, you start eating at 10 a.m. So kind of a late breakfast and you stop eating at 6 p.m. That's like at 16, eight. And, it's, and it, like, even that is, is, has been shown to be quite efficacious for insulin, blood glucose control. I'm just remembering this study uh, done at UCSD across around 2,400, 3,000 women, women that were fasting for over 13 hours a day had reduced overall mortality rates and reduced uh, recurrence of cancer. So the data is strong there. Plus for the people that like the, like the, the hot stuff, so to speak, it should help you gain muscle and lose fat. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, where is the best place for people to find you online and learn a little bit more? Uh, you can find me at Twitter at Jeffrey Wu, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y-W-O-O, or find us at human HVMN, HVMN.com or Twitter at HVMN. Yeah, I'm friendly. I, I like engaging with folks online. So just give, give me a shout. And we'll throw links and everything in the show notes, guys. One more big prediction, 10 years out. Give me something that no one's thinking of. Hmm. I think in 10 years, I think there will be some breakthroughs in diseases like Alzheimer's and diabetes, perhaps relating to like ketogenic diets and ketones, that, that pathway, the ketosis pathway. And I think another wild prediction, I think you might have these, uh, you, you, so the so, uh, like groups of people negotiating directly with governments. So basically, like you have Google and big companies, big corporations that are basically negotiating directly with sovereign governments. I can imagine within the next 10 years, you have groups of people that function as virtual sovereign entities. And you have like these virtualized groups of people together negotiating and begin creating their own nation states. Maybe we'll see our first virtual nation state in the next 10 years. There's actually, there's actually one now, Decentraland, I think, that's working on this. But uh, that, that would lead to so many different conversation points. Let's cut this off here. Thanks for coming on, Jeff. Hey, appreciate it, Matt. If you want more of Fringe FM, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or go to fringe.fm, where you'll find tons of audio and video interviews with leaders in the fields of genetics, cryptocurrency, longevity, AI, space, VR, and much, much more. And you can follow me on Twitter at It's Matt Ward. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a quick review in iTunes to help more people discover Fringe FM.